This is the Norris Group's Real Estate Investor Radio Show, the award-winning show dedicated to thought leaders shaping the real estate industry and local experts revealing their insider tips to succeed in an ever-changing real estate market. Hosted by author, investor, and hard money lender, Bruce Norris. Hi, thanks for joining us. My name is Bruce Norris, and today our special guest is once again Christopher Thornburg from Beacon Economics. All right, let's then let's uh, because this is uh, like I said when I introduced you, I get to ask questions I don't know the answer to. So let's unpack the Fed balance sheet a little bit because I know that that's uh, it used to be a trillion dollars like uh, for a long time, and then all of a sudden you know the two thousand eight popped in and you got that got to about four and it kind of grew, and then we backed off a little bit and then all of a sudden the pandemic hit and now we're between what eight point eight and. 8.9. Yeah, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me, I know you're going with this. So let me, let me give a, a brief. First of all, we have to understand Fed policy. Okay? okay. So the Fed uses the money supply to try and manipulate the economy. If it needs a little juice, you give a little more money. If you need to cool it off, you take a little money away. All right. So it's just as simple as that. You're just mixing in and out, in and out. Now, the traditional way you do that is through basically bank policy. The federal funds rate is the interbank lending rate. If you raise it, it becomes more expensive to borrow. Banks hang on to more reserves and vice versa. You lower it, they get more, more reserves, which it was a, a, it's a, a reasonably, shall we say, soft tool. It doesn't have super concrete results super quickly. Um, but it's, you know, it's what they've traditionally used. But when interest rates got very low in real in nominal terms, it became harder and harder to use it because you can't only lower nominal interest rates so much. You can't have a negative nominal interest rate. It just doesn't work. Ergo, um, what you end up doing here is going the next step. I still need to get money into the system, out of the system. Another way of doing it is for the Fed just to print money and buy bonds. Now, they can't buy any kind of bond. They have to have specific characteristics legally. For example, they can only buy U.S. Treasuries and uh, 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 Fannie and Freddie-backed uh, uh, real estate securities. Those are the only things they're legally allowed to purchase. Now, when you think about Ben Bernanke, Ben Bernanke, again, understands the difference between a depression and a recession is deflation. Deflation is often driven by a collapsing um, Financial market. When financial markets collapse, it creates deflationary pressure. In a sense, falling asset prices takes money out of the economy. Hence, the Federal Reserve has to replace it. So Ben Bernanke, over about six years, used about $3.5 trillion of quantitative easing, buying bonds to add money into the economy in order to offset the deflationary pressures of the collapse of the subprime bubble. And they did a marvelous job. M2 was nice and steady through that period of time. Now you flash forward and you no longer have an economist at the head of the Federal Reserve. You have a lawyer named Jerome Powell rose to the ranks of the New York Fed, I think is right. Um, you have a, 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 a crew of people on the board who are have been picked because of the stories they tell, because of they fit particular, shall we say, uh, 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 holes. <laughs> Oh, we need to have this kind of person and that kind of person. Not, we didn't hire smart bankers and people who understand monetary e economics. We hired people who had specific social views that we thought were important, okay. which is ridiculous for a federal bank, yeah. for a, federal, for a fed central bank. It's ridiculous, but they did it. So the pandemic hits. They're all reading in the paper these ridiculous stories that this thing's going to cause a, a depression, which, again, is completely preposterous, completely preposterous. So what happens? Well... Jerome Powell, over lunch, decides to do $3 trillion of quantitative easing. Seriously, $3 trillion. Ben Bernanke did $3.5 trillion over six years. He did $3 trillion. He decided in one day. And over the next month, they bought $3 trillion in bonds. And then, despite the fact that there was no financial crisis. Remember, Ben Bernanke was dealing with a real financial crisis. You had... Uh, uh, loan write-offs in the banking system hitting 3% per quarter. You had home prices falling 15%. You had massive foreclosures. You had massive numbers of bankruptcies. The economy, the financial system was a disaster. This time around, none of those things happened. Loan losses fell. There have been no foreclosures. There have been no delinquencies. 
there have been no, there was no collapse in home prices or, or the stock market. They all took off. They went the exact opposite direction. And so, of course, he logically said, oh, we're fine. So therefore, I'm going to take some of this money out. Aha, that's a joke. Of course he did. And he said, I'm going to do $2 trillion more in quantitative ease. He did. He lobbed $2 trillion more at the economy, despite the fact that there was no financial crisis. Honestly, if you look at this from a historical standpoint, this has got to be one of the dumbest things the Federal Reserve has ever done. It's insane that with no financial crisis, you would lob $5 trillion at the economy. But that's what he did. And doubled your debt. And of course, what ended up happening, well, that's the, Fed, that's the federal government. That's right. Story. Yeah. But more or less what they did was basically monetize the, de the federal deficit. The way to think about it is the federal government borrowed $7 trillion and $5 trillion of that came from the Fed printing money. That's basically what happened. Now, the result of this, of course, is one of the biggest expansions in money supply we've ever seen. Mm -hmm. M2 is up 40% from where it was two years ago. 40%. Now, to be clear, prices are the equilibrium between money and the size of the economy. If you increase M2 by 40%, holding all else equal, you can anticipate about a 40% increase in prices. We are now roughly 8% into it, and we have, oh, roughly 32% to go. Wow. Exactly. So the potential for inflation in front of us is vastly more than the inflation we've already seen behind us. And the only way to fix this is quantitative tightening. Moving the federal funds rate up, I don't care, two bips, three bips, whatever. You know, he's got to do, oh, he's got to do 0.75 again. So what? That's not the, that's not the gas pedal he hit. Okay, Thus well, hitting the brake there is not going to help either. I don't know how many people understand how you unravel that in the real world. In other words, okay, you're saying we have to reduce that 8.8 .8 trillion to some other number. What's the process and how painful is that? Well, People are complaining about interest rates right now, right? Oh, mortgage rates are almost 6%. Yeah, inflation's 8%. Ergo, the real interest rate on real estate is negative 2%. Right. They're paying you to borrow money <laughs> still. Mm -hmm. So until that gets positive, that is to say, they slam on the brake, they pull cash out of, out of the, the it's, what are they, they going to do is they're going to start selling bonds. That's how they got quantitative tight ease. So they're going to turn around, take treasuries, and as opposed to buying them off auctions, they're going to dump them back onto auctions. They're going to take those real estate securities and they're going to dump back on auctions. And they're going to absorb a lot of cash out of the system. Interest rates are going to go up strongly. Inflation is going to cool off. Ergo, real interest rates are going to go from negative to strongly positive. Okay. Indeed, I would argue that we may, may well be seeing double-digit mortgage rates in the next couple of years, um, both from a combination of the momentum of inflation combined with the Fed needing to get some of this cash out of the economy. 10% mortgage rate? Yeah, I could see that. Not a problem. Um, clearly, that's where we're heading. Okay. Well, no, that's great that you said that. When you say not a problem, what does that mean? When you have a, let's say a California, totally is. I'm California sorry. medium price at 890, <laughs> it's not going to be a 10% mortgage rate that they can get. Okay. Now we got to circle around housing. Yeah. Right? Hey, you are a housing guy, right? <laughs> and that's what we're here to talk about. We've been talking all over the map. Oh, no, I think we need to talk all talk about it. this to get but to let's, let, Yeah, but let's let's talk about what, what housing is going to do. Now, with this in mind, um, I want to, I want to, I don't know if I've told you this before, Bruce, but, uh, my connection with real estate is, is fairly profound in as much as my father was a real estate broker. In other words, I was raised eating commissions. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, and I remember I had a conversation with my dad and I said, what were the best years of your career as a real estate broker? And his answer was, believe it or not, 1983 to 1985, when interest rates were double digits. So Right off the bat, we start to start to realize that interest rates do not create or kill housing markets. It's a different kind of conversation. Rather, interest rates are just part of the cost, just like lumber and, and taxes and everything else. And 
once you adapt to whatever those costs are, the economy, the, the real estate market can do just fine. So if anybody's out there is freaking out that I said, oh, maybe 10 or 11% mortgage rates, don't. Because again, real estate can do just fine in those atmospheres. Now, how can it do so? Well, it has to have a couple of things. First of all, if interest rates are higher, you use more equity and less debt. Well, guess what? We're in great place for that because over the last decade, we've had a really low pace place, a low pace of mortgage debt growth in this country. Yeah. Quality has been fantastic. And as a result of that, the one place, you, you, again, you see lots of money in our economy today is in residential real estate. Absolutely. Get, get this. At the peak of the Great Recession, um, the, there was, before the Great Recession, excuse me, there was about $14 trillion of equity in U.S. real estate. And we had a debt to equity ratio of about 60%. Of course, all hell broke loose. Home prices fell. We bottomed out at about eight trillion dollars of home household equity with roughly the same debt to equity ratio mainly because all those people were getting foreclosed on and that right. was <laughs> okay now where are we as of the first quarter of this year we have 28 trillion dollars of household equity floating around the u.s economy 28 trillion three times where we were a decade ago and by the way the debt to equity ratio is the lowest it's ever been or tied with the lowest it's ever been and roughly where it was in 1983, 1984, 1985. So can this residential real estate market, by the way, we still have too little supply. We have two months supply of existing homes. Um, housing is fine and it will do fine once we get out of the inflation mess. <laughs> The issue here is not that housing is going to get clobbered. The economy is going to get clobbered as people have to face the reality. They are not as rich as they think they are, nor should they be consuming as much as they are. That's okay. going to cause a real problem in the economy. Real estate may well be a safe haven in the midst of that chaos. And on the back end, when we finally emerge from the chaos, Real estate almost assuredly, after being stalled for a few years because of the huge increase in real interest rates, will assuredly get going again in a relatively good pace. So residential real estate, you've got to be very worried about the big consumer cycle that's in front of us. But you don't have to worry about a real estate cycle. Because again, this time around, unlike the Great Recession where real estate was ground zero, this time around real estate is peripheral to the underlying situation in our economy. What's interesting too, that we're facing what you're saying could be, you know, uh, interest rates that are get to 10%. What would prompt anybody to sell an existing home with a two or three or 4% mortgage? And that might in, in, invariably lead to very little inventory available other than new housing. Yes. <laughs> that's why there's two months supply out there right now, right? And that's why the pressures continue, particularly for people trying to get into their first home, which a lot of people are trying to do right now. So, you know, that should spill over to the new home market. The problem is new homes are expensive, particularly now because of all the fixed costs. Thus, it's hard for the new home market to really, if you will, meet the demands of those entry level buyers who are trying to jump into home ownership right now. So, um, yeah, you have that little little bit of an issue. There's no doubt about it. But nevertheless, while well, you have some of those uh, secondary issues, uh, you still have a market that has, shall we say, a pretty thick armor. And uh, undoubtedly will be able to weather uh, the broader economic storms relatively well. What do you think will, will be the impact of foreclosures? Uh, or job losses, that type of thing, if you have a recession? Well, again, I, I look, there's always going to be some foreclosures. But again, I think it's going to be small. It's going to be people who are facing individual, shall we say, economic difficulties, not a broad collapse in real estate prices that make people go underwater. If you look at the 70s, um, what you'll see is as uh, as as the market the way to think about the 70s is this. This is what real estate did. Real estate got hit by the same fog bank everybody else did. 
and real estate slowly, slowly, slowly just basically slugged towards being flat throughout the whole economy did, right? And by the late 70s, nothing was happening. The recession hits, everybody takes a bit of a bump, a hit, but real estate actually was still pretty good. We didn't see wow. a lot of foreclosures because there was lots of equity. There was lots of cushion. That's right. And people just went to ground. They just, they just held, <laughs> you know? When you have a big liquidity cushion, you don't accept nominal price declines. You just sit there. You don't do anything. And the entire market goes illiquid. Well, so they, they had an 8% mortgage, which was a deal at that time, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But, you know, look, people have to move. Life goes on. You get into the 80s. The economy is moving. People are moving. I've got a new job in a new town. My kids move it out. I'm, I'm getting ready to retire. People are going to make decisions one way or the other. As long as you have an equity cushion that allows you to, shall we say, you know, listen, I have an 80% mortgage with a low interest rate. Now, I can keep my payment the same by going to a 60% loan to value at a higher interest rate, right? Nice. It means I got to more, use more equity. Right. And that's what people did in the 80s. So people started moving and they moved with more equity. And ultimately, the market did great. And like you say, if we if we've ever had equity, it's it's pretty much right at the moment. Twenty eight trillion dollars, Bruce. Yeah. And pr listen, prices are still going up. It's decelerating. There's no doubt about it. As as well it should, given the interest rates are coming up. But it's still a positive. I mean, God, a year from now, we may end up with thirty trillion dollars in equity. So again, you had an enormous cushion there. So you an think enormous cushion. That, that's interesting. So you think. All right. Well, you know, we're in the home sales business, let's yeah. say on occasion. And uh, so it's interesting that you say that um, because, you know, we did just go pending on a home uh, a couple of days ago at full price. And that was okay. I'm happy to see that, <laughs> you know, we've got a, in the next 12 months, there's a fair amount of inventory. So, you know, when I, when I sign up to take risks, I do a lot of calculation as you can imagine. Sure. And I, you know, I land on the square of, okay, what is this house rent for? What's the payment on this at seven or eight or, you know, so I can correlate some decision process for the respective right buyer. Here. Well, you just go, would I rather rent it 2,800 or own it 2,800? I think the answer on that will be quite often. Yes. Yeah. So, um, Interest rates, you know, since I was, I've been in real estate, I was, I joined uh, the fray in about the peak of the interest rate. So I, I became a real estate investor by refinancing my house at 17 and a half percent. So talk about bad timing. That was about, you could, the worst you could do, but then for 40 years, it's gone down. Yeah. So the trajectory going forward, there's a, there's a really good book I read. So I just wanted your take on that. The price of tomorrow. And it talks about the process of innovation and how it ultimately is deflationary. So I just wanted to know your take on that. Let's go out 10 years from now where you say, yeah, all that's sort of taken over the human need for working. <laughs> yeah, well, it's funny because, because I already said what you just said. <laughs> um, look, uh, remember prices are basically the equilibrium between the supply of money and the size of the economy. The con what you said was, was when the real economy gets bigger, prices are going to need to come down. That's why the Federal Reserve has to add a little money to the economy every year to basically keep up with real with the real size of the economy. If you don't increase the money supply in the face of real economic growth, you have deflationary pressures. Um, this is one of the reasons why the gold standard is uh, completely uh, unworkable in a true modern world. It's a fixed amount of money. Ergo, every time you get a, a surge of growth, you end up with a, a surge of deflation, which is bad for the economy. So, so a fiat currency is the way to go as long as you have a central bank that understands how to run the money supply accordingly. Well, again, I think we have pretty much proven that that second part, that is to say having a reliable Federal Reserve is not a guarantee. I mean, when they, in, in, under Truman, Remember, but prior to Truman, the Federal Reserve was actually a department of the Treasury. It was under the control of the president. And it was under Truman when after a lot of conversations on the part of economists, they said, you know, you really shouldn't do this. You really don't want the Federal Reserve 
under the control of the treasury. It should be its own independent beast. And it was then when they changed it to make it hands off. Truman signed, although he had a lot of consternation, they managed to get Truman to do the right thing and, and make the Federal Reserve functionally independent. And yeah, they weren't great, but for the most part, they did okay. Mm -hmm. In the 70s, there was clearly some mistakes being made, but it seemed as if in the early 80s, we they got in a grip. Volcker came in, he kind of cleaned house. We got to reset, which was nice, right? We 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 had a, 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 a free central bank called the Federal Reserve. They screwed up the first decade. We did the right thing. And again, 20, 30 years of good policy. You know, you had Volcker, then you had Greenspan, then you had uh, uh, Bernanke, and they did a hell of a job. Mm -hmm. But somewhere around 20 years ago, probably about the time when really our nation completely started to lose its collective mind, the political attacks in the Federal Reserve began. And we all remember, even during the Great Recession, how all these posturing, poising you know, politicians in, in D.C. were, oh, we don't know what these guys do. Oh, what's this clue? Who, who are you? Why do you get to make decisions? I'm the elected official here. And, and lo and behold, the Federal Reserve got sucked into the political narratives of the day. We have dequalified the board. The vast majority of people on the board have no idea how monetary policy works. Wow. They're not qualified to be there. And they're wow. making bad decisions. Okay. And clearly, I'm never going to be invited ever to a Federal Reserve conference in the rest of my life. <laughs> Pretty clearly. <laughs> Pretty clearly. Or they maybe they'll come to their senses and put you on it and say, okay, oh. what do we do? <laughs> yeah, right. Um, you know, about out of time. Let me just ask you a pretty straightforward question. If you didn't own a house right now, would you buy one? Oh, hell yeah. Okay. You know, you know your best investment is right now a 30-year fixed rate mortgage. Wow, even now. That's it's still a great negative statement. interest rate. It's still a negative interest rate. A negative rate interest rate. I you see, don't don't know, you know, you you think on a different plane. So don't know, don't think that that's like normal processing for most people. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the, and that's and that's why the concept of homo economists, of people who are rational, make rational decisions, is a little silly. Money illusion is the real deal. And money illusion is why dumping a bunch of economy money on the economy first creates this sense of euphoria and then of course the storm clouds come in right mm -hmm. um and that's exactly what, our, what we're dealing with and the problem is 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 the inclination is you know it's not unlike a uh if you will the 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 alcoholic who as soon as they start to get the hangover immediately goes back to the bottle and and that's the question here is is will Will we have, will Jerome Powell have the political will to hold to hold the line and actually continue to do what he needs to do? Well, if he ever starts doing it on quantitative tightening, will he actually hold that line? To be clear, there was a movement in the United States to impeach Paul Volcker because of the terrible damage he was doing to our economy. Yeah. And then we did good for a long time after that. You know, when you look in the mirror, Bruce, the problem is is us. It's not the Federal Reserve. It's us. We're the ones who listen to the ridiculous stories of our politicians, this populist nonsense. Oh, your lives are terrible, and it's because of the other party's policies. It's all they say. Mm -hmm. It's all driven by hatred and exclusion, and and nobody can compromise. Everybody's outraged all the time. We're angry and we have no reason to be. No, we don't. You know, it's and that's that's what it scares the death out of me, Bruce. At the end of the Nixon Library event every year, it's, uh, I've said the same thing for a decade. What I want this year is for every elected official to act like an American, not a Democrat or a Republican. <laughs> Wouldn't that solve a lot? Well, and that's more or less why Alexander Hamilton didn't want parties. He 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 recognized this centuries ago you know why because he's a student in history he was a student in history and guess what you know um what i've realized over the last again few years of my life is yes i have numbers i have fancy econometrics i have the technical training to do this kind of stuff 
But if you really want to be a good forecaster, you got to be a historian. You got to well, watch the stories. We created a uh, we created a metric called the Moodometer, and it's exactly yeah. that. It doesn't yeah. just calculate numbers; it calculates the mood of the participant. Yeah. And so I can tell when you're too happy for this asset and you're too sad about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, we need and we need a we need a lot of that at the national level. And, and 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 tragically, politicians don't get elected by telling people to stop being whiny little you know what's. You know what's interesting? One of the things that that they could do, and one of the things that helped in the 80s was we had a you know, we had a mortgage base that was at seven or eight or nine percent, and they allowed that to move forward to a new buyer. Yeah, you could change the dynamic of the real estate environment by letting that walk forward because the equity position is huge. You know, yeah, but, yeah, but to keep in mind, you're screwing the savers that much worse. There is a cost to doing that. Screwing the savers. So yeah, unpack that for me. remember, well, again, inflation is higher than interest rates. Ergo, if you buy a U.S. Treasury. You lose you're, the value of that. You're losing money on that asset. You're right. So there's an enormous shift in wealth from savers to borrowers in the U.S. And we have to be cautious about making that even worse with those kind of policies. There are consequences to the decisions we make, and you have to look at the entire situation to get a better balance on that. What, what did the 10 year T-bill get up to in the eight, in the early 80s? Is it like 12 or something? I boy, I'd have to go back and look. I, I am not sure, Bruce. But yeah, it got pretty high and it made borrowing really. Oh, and you know, we didn't even talk about the fiscal crisis we're about to deal with, too, because we have a trillion dollar structural deficit and our debt to GDP is 130 percent, which, by the way, is a heck of a lot higher than it was in 1979. It was 50 percent back then. Well, you're also because of inflation, you're about to give everybody on Social Security a heck of a raise. Oh, yeah. So at some point out there, there's a whole, and, and don't forget the co cost of carrying all this federal debt is going to go up tremendously. It's been two and a half percent of GDP for the last 15, 16 years. Well, it's about to go to three and a half to four and a half percent. I'm so glad I, just I'm the glad increase I put a, in interest rates I'm are glad going to I, cause the deficit to be worse. I'm glad I created a cover of a report that said 2% mortgage rates, 40, 40 trillion in debt. That was pretty fortunate, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Not at the same time period, though. No. Yeah. All right, Christopher, I have enjoyed it as always and very informative. I took some notes that I will have to, I have to think of uh, things differently. You know, this was fun. Thanks a lot. And you know what? Thanks for, thanks for sharing what you know, because you've had a really good impact on uh, the audiences that you talk to. I think they all leave and go, oh, I hadn't thought of that. Well, thank you, Bruce. And and I always appreciate your time and uh, your, <laughs> yeah. Now you got a visit from the cat. That's cool. I got, I got, oh, he's actually, she's been sitting here the whole time, to be honest. Oh, with okay. you. <laughs> so, she, she I, I know not to do what that boy does. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Chris. Thanks a lot. All right, Bruce. We'll have see you. Good. All right. Bye-bye. For more information on hard money loans and upcoming events with the Norris Group, check out thenorrisgroup.com. For information on passive investing with trust deeds, visit tngtrustdeeds.com. The Norris Group originates and services loans in California and Florida under California DRE License 01219911, Florida Mortgage Lender License 1577, and NMLS License 1623669. For more information on hard money lending, go to thenorrisgroup.com and click the hard money tab.